dove appunto? Well, uh, thanks, good morning you all, my name is Jacopo Cerri and I'm from Scuola Superiore Sant'Anna. I'm very glad of being here because indeed I will talk about uh, a lot of work that I do in my free time. This is not about my PhD, but it is a topic of research that I definitely find interesting. Uh, I'm also, I will also be brief because usually my voice expires in 15 minutes, so that's the amount of time. And well, which role social sciences could play in invasion biology? Indeed, basically they have two different roles. On the one hand, they provide us a valuable toolbox um, of tools to measure human behaviors, collecting data, usually in forms of questionnaires or surveys. On the other hand, and that's more challenging, they offer us the possibility to understand, eventually predict, and eventually change human behavior. These two components, for example, are very useful for informed policy making, for studying social phenomena, also for generating new ideas, which is something usually very neglected in conservation, ultimately to improve policy making about biological invasions. And the, the crude reason why we cannot ignore them is that we are almost 8 billion people in the world, so ignoring society is at least short-sighted. Well, uh, my presentation will focus on surveys and questionnaires, just because they are the dominant approach in social sciences. In the last 40 years, the vast majority of social sciences and human dimension studies adopted questionnaires, and despite, well, things are becoming more and more difficult just for one reason. We are continuously overexposed to surveys and questionnaires, so the response rates are dropping sharply. And uh, basically, we have to collect more and more data and to spend more and more money. Well, however, they are still quite cost effective because they allow us to measure human behavior, usually in form of self reports, and um, at, the more high, at a higher level, they also enable us to measure psychological traits. For example, we can measure attitudes or values or whatsoever. This is a very good read. It's a whole book about survey research, so I will provide you the presentation. If you need anything, there is basically everything inside. Well, so what do surveys do in conservation biology? Basically, they enable us to measure self-reported information over large and sometimes representative samples at a relatively reasonable price. Usually we measure behavior, but also attitudes. When you have stakeholders, and stakeholders pop up in your office and ask you, tell me what people think about these, usually they have in mind attitudes. Attitudes are a latent tendency to approve or disapprove something, and everyone wants to measure attitudes, and they are not everything, but they are definitely popular. You can also measure social norms when they exist. Social norms are informal institutions that are very powerful in governing human behavior in society, and also values and value orientation. This is what I do for my research, for example. Attitudes are not everything, but they are very easy to measure. Usually you require a few questions and a scale, People love attitudes. There are attitudes in everything, and unfortunately, people always have attitudes, even about things they don't know anything. People have attitudes about the Obamacare, immigration, toilet paper, space, aliens, whatsoever, and sometimes they're also conflicting. You can have at the same time positive and negative attitudes. And the reason why they are the bulk of social psychology is that sometimes they explain behavior, sometimes they don't. My best advice is that if you really want to measure attitudes, so if people like or dislike something, be firmly sure that their attitudes are strong and stable. If you measure weak attitudes, weak attitudes are useless. You will squander your money. Attitudes are grounded in direct experience and consistence. And if they are important to our identity, for example, you are conservationist, so I assume that your attitudes about wildlife are generally stable because they are important to define who you are, it is worth to measure them. In most other cases, it will be pointless. If I ask you attitudes about things you considered four times in your life, like macroeconomics, that wouldn't definitely be helpful. Usually for measuring attitudes, for example, about squirrel, one of the best approaches is the so-called BE scoring. Uh, it was theorized by Eisen and Fishbane, 
And basically, you have to imagine the consequences of a certain action. Let's assume like the presence of gray squirrel in an urban park. And for each one of these consequences, you have to measure specific beliefs. And notably, the expectancy values, so how likely or unlikely you deem an impact to be. And the valence, so how good or bad you deem. This is what we are doing for round squirrels with a colleague of mine. Well, I adapted for gray squirrels because it makes common sense, but it is species specific. All these are potential consequences. This is a scale. And basically, what you do is like you create two blocks of items. In the first, scale, in the first case, you ask people to agree or to disagree with the likelihood of these impacts. And in the second case, to rate them as good or bad. Surveys are really nice. I mean, they are really nice measurement tools, provided that they are properly implemented. If you do not implement them, especially if they are quantitative, you are wasting time, money, and paper. Because if you do not have a theoretical basic, theoretical basis, if you don't do piloting, if your questions are unclear, and if you don't do latent variable analysis, they they are just useless. Uh, usually, here are the most common errors, and they are really common. This is another really good read because it's a chapter from the former book that I cited. But indeed, I really encourage you to download it because this is the best chapter of the whole book and it's for free. And it's basically, it's a to-do list when you're implementing a questionnaire of do's and don'ts about good questions and horrible questions. Sometimes questionnaires fall shortly because uh, you have to elicit uncomfortable questions, sensitive questions. Sensitive questions arise uh, whenever you're exploring taboos about sexuality, about illegal behavior, like let's assume drug consumption, or for example, social desirability. Social desirability is about uh, uh, rules, a lot of behavior, for example, attitudes about sensitive phenomena. And conventional questionnaires are unsuitable. You cannot pop up in front of the people and ask them, well, what do you think about sex? probably the answer will be biased. Or have you ever broke the law? It's very unlikely that they will answer you in an honest way. You can elicit honest answering by introducing noise in their data. And these questioners, the so-called specialized questioning techniques, like the randomized response, are pretty funny because basically you introduce a privacy protection mechanism by making people playing with dice. They throw a dice and they force their answers. So if the outcome is one, they always answer yes. If the six is always, it's, oh, it's always negative. And for some outcomes, they answer honestly. We tried then to measure how many people in the Arno River fish without a fishing license. On the left, uh, on the, left the, the lightest bar is the, the conventional questioner. And as you see, the proportion of people in our sample was like the 12%. On the right, the black bar, we adopted a randomized response and almost 30% of people were fishing without having the license. We also applied for two behaviors that are really relevant for biological invasions, like releasing invertebrate baits or releasing fish baits, and the results are really good. Now we are experimenting more advanced uh, approaches to this technique by combining two questions for measuring illegal European catfish restocking in the Arno River. And well, it works because um, respondents are usually well confident. They generally answer the questioner, uh, respected the rules because, of course, you have statistical models to test whether people complied with instructions. And in our cases, we found that a proportion of about eight percent of respondents are actively restocking European catfish. Sampling is very important, as I already said here. Um, Surveys enable us to collect information over large and maybe representative samples. Surveys are ultimately a picture of society. Really, you want to explore some social phenomena and you collect data and you want to obtain a good picture because if you obtain a poor picture like this, you will never find the monster. It's been a century and with these pictures, you reach no points. And unfortunately, the quality of the picture is the amount of money you pay in questioner. I mean, you can be very good in developing the survey, so good measurement tools, but ultimately you have to pay a lot of money to ensure a good sampling. There is no short way, there is no telephone book, no address. There are panels of participants and companies sell them. And they sell them at a relatively reasonable price, but this is probably much more than what you expected because sometimes they cost a lot of money. And if your questionnaire is too long, people will not answer, so you need to split your sampling and to sample in multiple waves. And, well, unfortunately, companies, they want to see you their panels. 
so they don't give you all the advices they need. So you have to be very critical. Furthermore, in conservation, there is another critical topic, hard to reach populations. If you really want to sample general people, it's not too hard. Uh, you take a general directory of the population and extract people. That's random sampling, stratified random sampling. But when you're counting homeless people or when you're counting poachers or just anglers, you do not have a directory. There is no register because if 30% of anglers do not have a license, a register of license is an unreliable source for sampling. And I think that, in my opinion, you can really sell well your expertise because uh, capture recapture approaches are becoming very popular in social sciences because they are really effective and you can do capture and recapture with participants to questioner as well. Uh, well, surveys are not everything. To be very honest, if you need rich and structured data, if you really want to understand what's going on, all you need is not a form. You need to talk with people, face to face or in groups, and qualitative methods are much better. To be very honest, I think that in 50% of the cases uh, of the researchers I cooperated with, they just needed good qualitative methods to elicit information. And they are really, really nice methods because you can elicit observations from people, what they think. Sometimes qualitative methods provide more information than what you were expecting in advance. You interview people and maybe unpredictable details emerge. We are sampling in, to, in turn for the, the gray squirrel, people foraging gray squirrels, and we found that the majority of people are really concerned by the quality of the food they give to squirrels. This was completely unexpected, and certainly you cannot record that in a survey. And they are really good also for social media and deliverable in a project. You can do interviews, you can do audio data, you can do documentaries, and you can create deliverables. So they are really nice. This is a really nice review paper that examines all the various qualitative methods in conservation. And as you can see, they come up in many flavors. You have interviews, focus groups. Some of them are also very good for decision making. You can combine people together, letting them talk, letting them interact, of course moderating the process, and sometimes collective decision making arises. And finally, we have vignettes. My voice is expiring. Vignettes are really useful for decision making. A vignette is a fictive scenario and it's very useful for decision making. For example, this scenario might describe an eradication program for an invasive species. These scenarios are generated by combining the characteristic of the program in a random way and then you ask people, you administer multiple scenarios to the various participants and you ask them to evaluate. This is what we are doing for cottontails in Tuscany. We asked hunters about which characteristics they would have found uh, good for uh, an, uh, an, a control program and eventually which program would have led them to participate. And of course each program was characterized by various attributes and each, this, each vignet was a description like this of the program. Then all the levels are scrambled but ultimately we asked participants whether they participated. So, big nets are really good because they are extremely robust, they, they are more robust than quantitative surveys and they are quite flexible, but of course they require advanced competencies, but for decision making they are really better, much much better than questioners. And surveys and questioners are not bad because of course they are really good for obtaining structured information, provided that you really want to pay money, so if you don't want to pay money in social sciences, you measure garbage, so just like in biology, you just don't go out of the door and ask people whoever you encounter in the street. It's not that way. If you want to do these, there are qualitative methods and provided they are properly designed, they are really nice. So they have very different flavor and I strongly encourage you to experiment them because they really help you. If you have any questions, and that's fine. Oh, no. I'm not still choking, so please. Uh, could you go back to the slide where you explain the random method? The randomized response, yeah. the one with the dice. The 
one with nice. uh, little oh, thanks. bar graphs. Then, no, 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 this one. Uh, can you explain again what is quite different in response between the first type of bar and then the random answer? Uh, well, it, it was really funny because we compared three different methods over three different samples of respondents. We randomly assigned participants to three techniques. Uh, on the left, you can find conventional questionnaires. So you have a pen and you fill a form. In the central one, there was a complex mechanism with a urn, like people playing with colored piece of paper, like moving papers, just to answer questions, but it didn't work that well. And on the right end, we ask people to uh, do the randomized response, so to play with dice before answering. So the answer was anonymized. It's really funny because people like it and because they understand that of course, if you are not there observing their completion process, if they are alone, they really well understand that the answer will be anonymous. It's not perfect because it's very demanding and it's just good for single questions. So you get a more, let's say for dangerous questions, you get a more reliable... Yeah, it's more reliable. Yeah, and this is clear because usually in sensitive behaviors, the higher the prevalence, the better the method is because it approaches uh, the real prevalence in the population. All validation studies show this point. In our three cases, it was clear that, for example, <laughs> a lot of people was fishing without a license or releasing worm baits without disposing them in the garbage. Thank you, Jan, for everything. Yes. Uh, we'll finish here because we are sure. running out of time. I will answer you afterwards without the details, but uh, I didn't understand really what it was, but uh, uh,